We'll be on the opposite end of the book here. Job chapter 41. We're going to read the entire chapter. I really want to get a, uh, a good understanding here, uh, lay a foundation for the message. So we'll read the entire chapter, Job chapter 41, starting in verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose, or bore his jaws through with a thorn? Will he make, the, will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Will thou make him play with will thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish spears? Lay thy hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. Behold the hope of of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his knee scenes a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fly fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He upholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you be with us um, this time as we open your word. I pray that uh, you speak through me, Lord, that I be filled with your spirit, and that I say only what you would have me to say, and meet the needs that are present here tonight. And Lord, I pray that you use this to draw us closer to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we have uh, the description of Leviathan. And it is really a fascinating description here, an entire tra chapter devoted to this one creature. And his power uh, and basically really man's in insignificance before him. The, the description here is really so fantastic that many actually seek to discount the biblical assertion that this creature actually existed. Um, you see people trying to explain away the descriptions, um, kind of allegorize it, and many people try to say that this is a metaphor for the devil. Uh, and there is, a, there is a verse in Isaiah that uses Leviathan uh, uses the word Leviathan referring to the, the devil, uh, but this is, def this is describing a clear, uh, clear-cut creature that Job was familiar with. You see it in the common sense approach that, Job, or that God is talking to Job about it. He just says, hey, you know, can't sell dry out Leviathan with the hook. It's, 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 it's how he switches from talking about behemoth, which would be another dinosaur, and now he just switches to Leviathan. 
very common sense way of, of talking about this creature. You see other animals that God references when he's talking with Job in this conversation. And nobody else disputes any of those other animals. Uh, but they like to try to dispute this one here. Um, Leviathan, indeed, was a fire-breathing sea dragon, if we want to put it in our terminology. Um, he was, came out of the depths. The Bible says he made the deep to boil. Um, he makes a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Uh, we see the fire breathing part um, in verses, uh, let's see, verses 18 through 21. Deal with that, his ability to, to breathe fire. And this was a creature, again, Job was familiar with. He knew, he knew about Leviathan. Maybe he hadn't seen him, but he had heard stories about him. And God is talking about him here to Job. Now, we may not come across any fire-breathing dragons today. But we do run across some pretty uh, fearsome creatures uh, that are still alive in creation today. In Alaska, of course, uh, one of the most fearsome would be the bear. Uh, grizzly bear, polar bear, black bear, you can take your pick. We, ha we have a few that you can pick from. Different parts of the world, there are other ones. Uh, we can think of uh, down in jungle-type areas, PNG, you would have the saltwater crocodile. Uh, one that you really would not want to have to face unarmed and in close quarters. In Africa, of course, there's the lion. There's many types in Africa. You, could, you wouldn't want to face a water buffalo. You wouldn't want to face an elephant or a hippo or crocodile. A um, few different ones in Africa. In India, you have the tiger. Um, and in the, if you're going into the ocean, there's sharks. Uh, definitely wouldn't want to run into too many of those, again, without any weapon or, uh, or come upon, upon them unprepared. And again, if we were to come across any of these creatures unarmed, uh, it would change our behavior. Uh, we, we would change how we were acting. And even if we had not seen one, but we knew that the, their presence was a possibility, we would be more cautious. Um, if you're walking on a trail, sometimes you'll, you'll have people walking the other way and they'll say, we wouldn't want to go any farther, there's a bear up ahead. Uh, well, guess what? I'm not just going to go keep on my merry way, I'm going to turn around. Um, I'm going to change my behavior. Or if you know there's a moose and a couple calves up ahead, I uh, probably want to give it some distance. It will change how we act. No creature demanded this change of attitude or behavior like Leviathan. Leviathan was, again, the, the, as God said, basically he was made without fear. Um, and just, just, a, just an incredible creature here that God has made. Um, Really, if you want to call it the, the uh, pinnacle of, of, the an, of the animal kingdom was Leviathan. Nothing, he, he wasn't worried about anything. He wasn't worried about a lion coming, about coming across a lion or a tiger. And you can see different animals coming, coming into contact, and they'll kind of give each other some respect. And, and if they're not in a particularly aggressive mood, they'll just kind of pass and go on their merry way. Uh, Leviathan wasn't giving anybody respect. And he, just, he just didn't care. But I want to talk, draw your attention to verse 10, and this is going to be the point of this message. None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? God speaking to Job, he says, you wouldn't dare try to get Leviathan angry, to stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Now again, we would never seek to stand before or stand against Leviathan or, or, or any of the creatures that I've mentioned, uh, or you can talk about different, different creatures, snakes, um, all these different creatures that we would give some respect to, but do we show the same respect or how is our attitude toward their maker, toward their creator? If the mere possibility of a bear being present causes our senses to be heightened and a much more thoughtful, a much more careful approach to be given... How much more should the presence of God induce this care in our behavior? If we cannot stand before or stand against or be aggressive toward these creatures, how in the world can we hope to do so to their creator? So we're going to look at two, point, two main points here for this message. One, the ways that we stand before God as it is given in this context... And then we'll look finally at the ways of God. It shouldn't take very long. But the ways that we stand before him. Again, the word stand, the two 
words there, stand before, carries different meanings depending on context. Um, one context is service, to stand before him. Um, Samuel stood before uh, Eli to help serve and to help minister to, to Eli. But in the context of, of this chapter, it's clearly standing against, to be aggressive toward, to stir up, as, it, as that's what it's contrasted with. None is so fierce that dare stir him up, who then is able to stand before me. So how do we stand before God? How, we, how do we stand against God in our life? How do we do this? Now again, it's not something we want to do, but oftentimes we'll find ourselves doing it. So what are some different ways that we do it? To illustrate this, to illustrate how we stand before God sometimes, we're going to use the bear, a familiar creature to us. And I want to have you guys imagine meeting a bear while walking on a trail. Again, you're unarmed. I know a lot of you hunters will be like, well, I'll just pull out my gun and, and blast him. That's great. I'm given a scenario where, for whatever reason, God has jammed your gun. <laughs> and now you are, you are unarmed and in close proximity to a grizzly bear, or whatever bear you fear the most. So I'm going to ask some questions about how we would act toward that bear, and then see if it's any different to how we act toward God. So the first question I have is, would we show some fear, would we show some respect to this bear? Those who do not fear bears are insane. Just, just putting it out there. I mean, we have the, I can't remember his name right now, um, the, the man who, who said he was going to go out and live among the bears. That didn't turn out very well for him. It's a little bit of insanity there. But a fear, as you're coming across this bear, again, close proximity, this fear will change your behavior. You're not going to be gone, just going along, whistling, going on your merry way. It's going to change your behavior. Priorities will take place very quickly. Maybe before your priority was just having a good time getting some exercise. Well, guess what? That's no longer your priority. Your priority now is survival. Making sure that you survive this encounter. You become very situationally aware. All right. Where is the best place to go if this bear decides to charge? Are there any trees around I can climb that might help me out? Are there any rocks or stumbling th places where I, that I should avoid if I'm trying to get away from this bear? You become very situationally aware. In biblical terms, you are walking circumspectly. You are walking circumspectly now. You are very much aware of dangers around you, and you are going to behave in a manner that will remove you from that danger. You're going to act in a way that Try to minimize the threat to the bear. Try to assure the bear, I'm not a threat to you. We're on great terms. You and I, we're just, we're just tight, so let's just, just, just kind of go our merry way and, and we can settle this peaceably. That's how we would act toward a bear. Would we have some fear and respect? I believe so. Any sane person would. And while we'll never see God manifest himself physically on this earth, um, until the rapture, we do know that he is always near. The Bible says that the Lord is at hand. His eyes go to and fro throughout all the earth. So we know he is always near, so do we fear him? Do we show him some respect? And your life's actions tell you the answer to that question. Well, how you act will tell you whether you fear it. Just like you can tell if someone is fearful of a bear by how they act, if they're showing the bear some respect by how they act. And a fear for God will always produce a certain type of behavior that is always going to be in line with the Word of God. Let's look at 2 Chronicles. This illustrates a few different portion, uh, portions of Scripture we could go to to illustrate how a fear of God impacts your behavior. But we'll turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. And we'll look at a few verses here. Second Chronicles 19, starting in verse 5. 
It says, And he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city. This is King Jehoshaphat. And said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. So Jehoshaphat is going to set up, he's going to establish a judicial system in the kingdom of Judah. And he sets up these judges, and his instruction to these judges are, judge in the fear of the Lord. Let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Because Jehoshaphat knew if, the, if they feared God, they would not be taking bribes. They would not be showing favoritism in their judgment. There would be a certain behavior that they would follow and a certain behavior that they would avoid because they had the fear of God in place in their life. Numerous portions of scripture, as I said, that illustrate that. We can think of Obadiah, uh, Ahab's steward, who, uh, who Elijah met on the way. And because of his fear for God, the Bible says that he had feared God from his youth on up. He uh, saved some of the, some of the uh, people of God and was uh, giving them food and water, something that was very scarce during the famine, uh, during Elijah's day. And so a fear of God motivated behavior. A fear of God always affects how we act. Just like a fear of a bear would affect how you act, you can think of fear of mice. Some, some people have famously, you know, standing on a chair to get away from a, from a mouse. A fear of a mouse affects behavior. Fear of bear affects behavior. A fear of God will always affect our behavior. Are we giving the bear more fear or are we giving God more fear? Who are we fearing? Who are we respecting more? The creature or the creator? Do we walk circumspectly or do we walk carelessly before God? Do we have fear? Do we have respect in place in our life toward God? Second question. As you're walking along and you meet this bear, would you insist that the bear adjust to you? In other words... I wanted to go on that path, Bear. You need to adjust to my will, my desires. You need to change your way to fit my desires. And I think, again, those of us who are of sound mind would not walk up to the bear and insist that he adjust his actions to accommodate our desires. Um, again, if we did so, we would not be able to act for very long. So would we tell the bear either verbally or non-verbally by our actions that, what, that we are going to do what we want to do and he has to accept that about us? We're just going to go press on and you'll just have to work, deal with it. Would we tell the bear that? I don't, I don't think so. We would never act this way toward a bear. Yet we do this to God all the time. We insist... We're going to do what we want to do, and you'll just have to deal with it. You'll just have to put up with it. Again, the prevailing thought of today is that God doesn't really care how you act. He's a God of love. He loves you just the way you are. And yes, God does love everyone. But he also expects, expects his children to conform their ways to his desires, not the other way around. Let's look at Romans, book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we'll read one verse here. Verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let's turn to Romans 12, we'll read verse 2. <clears throat> And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God expects his children to conform their actions to his will. To conform their lives to the image of God. To be more Christ-like. But too often we go up to God and we say, I am going to do what I want to do. 
And you either bless me or get out of my way. That's how we act. We act better toward a bear than to, toward our creator, toward our savior. The one who shed his blood, hung on a cross, went through such agony for our sins. And we act better toward a dumb animal. Something that we have been made above. Astounding. We insist that God adjust his ways to our desires. And you see it very prevalent in churches today. They'll say, well, we're just going to run our churches the way that we want to run them in a way that will get the numbers in. We don't care what God, how God wants a church to look like or what uh, requirements God has laid out for a church. We're just going to do it our own way. And I'm sure God will bless us because we put the name Christian on our church. Again, it really is amazing. What an affront it is to God. Third question, as we meet this bear, would we tell him that he had made a mistake? You've made a mistake coming here, man. You don't know who you're messing with. If I faced a bear, I would not tell them that he had made a mistake in the course that he had chosen. Um... I wouldn't seek to correct his way. Oh, you're going the wrong direction here, Bear. Let, you know, let me tell you uh, where you should be going right now. <clears throat> I would do everything I could to make sure that his way is unimpeded in order for the account to end peaceably. Try to do everything I can to make sure this is a peaceable encounter. You just go wherever you want to go, and I, I'll, you're not, I, if I get in your way, it's my bad. It's my mistake. And that's, how, that's kind of how we think even in, in when we hear about these encounters, uh, horrible encounters where someone gets mauled by a bear. I don't really think I've ever heard, well, the bear made a mistake. It was, well, he made a mistake, he didn't bring his gun along. Or, you know, the stupid dog brought the bear back to the owner. Thanks, dog. Man's best friend right there. We don't say, oh, the bear made a mistake. We would say the person made the mistake dealing with this. Um, because typically the one who made the mistake is the one who has the least amount of power in the situation. <clears throat> God makes no mistakes. He is infallible. When he sets a course, we don't go up to him and tell him, you made a mistake. We need to do our best to ensure that the encounter is peaceable. That when he encounters us, and obviously I know he's always with us, but when that encounter takes place where God has come to us and here's the way I'm going to go and you should be going this way too, do we make sure that this encounter is peaceable or do we resist him? Do we stand before him? Do we stand against him? Now again, this will sometimes, oftentimes, mean adjusting our life. But it's for our benefit to do so. Let's look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. When God has set a course for chastening in our life, do we tell him he's made a mistake? Or do we make sure everything ends up in the most peaceful resolution possible? Hebrews chapter 12, we'll begin reading in verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. <clears throat> Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. When God has set a course that we don't agree with, sometimes the bear has set a course that we don't agree with, we, we don't tell him he's made a mistake. We adjust our way to him. Do we adjust our ways to God's way? Or do we just dig in our heels and say, you made the mistake. And yes, you've set this course, but I don't like the course you've set. And so it's your mistake, not mine. It's not always joyful. As, it's, as Hebrews tells us. But it's so much better for us for that to be a peaceable encounter 
and yield ourselves to God than for us to get stiff-necked and dig in our heels and, and, be, and stand against God, stand before Him, as it says with the context of Job. Just three questions. I think there's a few others you could probably throw in there. Would we have some fear of this bear, have some respect? I think so. Shouldn't we have respect for God? And that fear for God, fear of God, will produce a behavior that is pleasing to Him? Do we insist that God adjust His way to us? Amazing. But we do this all the time in our lives, oftentimes without even knowing it. And then we, we tell God He made a mistake. Just amazing. We would never do that to, one of the, to a fearsome creature of His. But we do it to God all the time. Now, the ways of God. We'll finish this up here uh, quickly. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 55. <clears throat> God asked Job, or who then is able to stand before me? If I have made Leviathan this creature that it would take armies to destroy, who is able to stand before me? The ways of God, the power, might of God are above our ability to comprehend, let alone fight against successfully. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The Word of God is full of verses detailing the incredibleness of our God. I, I, the book of Isaiah is, is full of them. I love, I love the book of Isaiah. It just talks about how mighty God is and how much better he is than any other God we would choose to try to put in our life. We don't, e we don't have the time to even begin to describe how much God is superior to us. Uh, and I don't even think we could if we had the time. God is so far above us we can't even comprehend it. You know, I can comprehend someone who's seven foot ten, how much taller they are than me. I can't comprehend how much greater God is, how much more wisdom he has, how much more power he has than I do. I can't comprehend it. So, again, we don't have the time to dive into it very much. We're going to simplify it, this point down to three major aspects of God's power. His omniscience or his all, the fact that he's all-knowing, his, om, uh, his omnipotence, he is all-powerful, and his omnipresence, he is everywhere at once at the same time. First off, his omniscience, let's look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40, read verses 27 and 28. Isaiah 40, verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. <clears throat> there is nothing the Lord does not know. In these verses, Isaiah is admonishing those who thought they were going to hide their sins from God. My way is hid from the Lord. And he's like, haven't you heard? I hate to break the news to you, but don't you remember who you're talking to, who you're dealing with? This is the Lord, the one who faints not, the one who has all understanding. <clears throat> there is no hiding anything from God. The sins that we commit when no one is around, God knows. Those thoughts we think about others, God knows. Those private despairs that we have, God knows. We cannot stand before God or stand against God because He knows everything about us. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. If you're going to stand against another human... 
And he knows all your weaknesses in this physical fight that you're about to get into. You're in trouble. He knows everything about you. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows the fact that you have a glass jaw, but you have a strong right hook. You're in trouble. God knows everything about you. And there is nothing we can do that would ever surprise him. I think we sometimes, because of our finite minds, we fail to comprehend who we're dealing with. God not only knows the thoughts that you're thinking now, he knows the thoughts you are about to think. He knows the thoughts that you're going to think in 20 years, in 30 years. How does he know that? He's already there. He exists outside of time. And we'll get, a, get into that a little bit later. Nothing we can do can surprise God. He knows everything about us. He is omniscient. How can we hope to stand against him? Why would we even attempt to try to thwart his will in our life? He is omniscient. Secondly, he's omnipotent. His omnipotence. Isaiah, well, well the, the ending of that chapter also points to his omnipotence. But let's look at chapter 46, and we'll read verses 9 through 11. Isaiah 46, starting in verse 9. It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. God will do what he wants to do. Sometimes he, well, he wants to give us that free will. And so he will let us have that choice. Amazing thing. If we were in God's shoes, we'd be, no, that guy's about to make a stupid decision. I'm going to take away his free will for this few minutes of time so that he won't make that stupid decision in his life. He's going to ruin everything. But God wants us to choose to serve him, to choose to love him. So he lets us have that free will. But he does what he wants to do. As is referenced here in these verses, he is in control of the events of the geopolitical realm. All this stuff, you, war in Ukraine, whatever is floating across the United States that we uh, keep, have shot down a few things here recently, God knows all about that. He's in control of all that. He raised up Cyrus, the great king of Persia, in order to bring the Israelites back out of captivity to the promised land. As he says here, he's calling a man that executed this council from a far country. He says, I want this done, and so I'm going to call this man out of a far country, and I'm going to get him over here, and he's going to do it. I have purposed it, I will also do it. He is in control of the events of the world, but there is not a sparrow that dies that he has not allowed the death of. He is, in, he is in control of the major events of the world, but he is in control of the most minute details that take place. His power is infinite. Those who fight against God will find that he has arranged for their downfall. He used Babylon to judge his people. And he's like, well, Babylon, you're going against me. I'm going to arrange for your downfall. You see God's hand throughout history. Those who fight against God will find their own destruction. And that he has arranged it. Those who seek to please God will find that the Lord's doing is marvelous in their eyes. There is nothing that astounds me more than looking back on my life and seeing, wow, was God moving. I had no clue at the moment, but God was just arranging everything and brought it all to fruition in his time. It is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. God not only created the universe, but he upholds it. See that in Colossians chapter 1. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. The laws of nature that we take for granted. If I jump, I take it for granted that I'm coming back down. Why? What's well, the law of gravity? God's upholding that. 
He's keeping that in place. It is God's mere pleasure that is keeping that in place. Or else we'd all be bouncing off the ceiling here. God is omnipotent. How in the world would we choose to stand against him? Lastly, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. Let's look at Psalm chapter 139. Just a great psalm here. I always love it when uh, preachers say something like that. And you're like, well, as opposed to some of those mediocre psalms that are out there. Psalm 139, verse 7 is where we'll begin. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the, light, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. David here just speaking to the fact that God's presence is everywhere. There is no place you can go on earth or throughout the universe that God is not there. That's one of the reasons he is omniscient, because he's already been there. He knows everything. He's already there. He is not bound by space. He is not bound by matter. He is not bound by time. He created those. And thus, he stands outside of those. Like Leviathan, unlike the bear, there is no place we can flee from God. It is far better to flee to God. Why in the world would we stand against somebody who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present. And we're going to stand against him. Just amazing. So how does this knowledge of his attributes, as we close here, how does this knowledge change our behavior? Does it affect our behavior? Again, we would not think of standing before a Leviathan. We would not say, hey, there's that fire-breathing dragon over there. He looks like he's sleeping. I'm going to go poke him with a stick. We wouldn't say that. Like, oh, let's give him some room. Let's show some fear, some respect. But how often we stand against God. We act without fear. We insist that he made a mistake and that he needs to conform his will to our desires. We read a lot in Isaiah. What was Isaiah's view of God? When he had that vision, and he was in the throne room of God, and he just said, wow, this is God Almighty. Woe is me. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is the view of God we need to have. So consider your life. Have you been acting toward God in a manner that you would never act toward one of his more fearsome creatures? What an error in judgment that would be. Are you trying to stand before God? Are you trying to stand against God tonight in your life? Let's go ahead and bow our heads, close our eyes.